Welcome to the No Sports Report, a production of iHeartRadio and Treefort Media. My name is Jensen Karp, and I'm a sports fan. And yes, I'm excited about the never-ending breaking news about what leagues are coming back soon, but also so many athletes are testing positive. Malcolm Brogdon, Charlie Blackman, Novak Djokovic, the Phillies disclosed that seven players have had COVID-19, and an astounding 28 student athletes at Clemson University have tested positive. So let's not pretend like we're out of the woods yet. Every day is going to be an adventure, and I think we're just touching the surface. And after you touch the surface, please wash your hands. And yes, I'm still talking to athletes and sports industry professionals about what they're doing during this weird time, hoping to figure out if they miss competing as much as I miss watching it. This is the No Sports Report with some sports now. Over 40 episodes in, and tennis legend Pat McEnroe is my first guest who was actually diagnosed with coronavirus. The former captain of the U.S. Davis Cup has had some success in singles, but was a highly decorated doubles player with 16 titles, most notably one at the 1989 French Open. His brother John might be more remembered for his signature temper on the court, but Pat has went on to work in the development of young tennis players as an Olympic captain at Athens 2004 and the former general manager of USTA Player Development. He's also a prolific tennis announcer and an analyst for ESPN, who, yes, back in March, tested positive for COVID-19. He spent two weeks in his basement, avoiding his wife and teenage daughters like some sort of tennis racket holding Babadook, and was able to actually be productive, if you can believe it. Now, out of captivity, we speak about his symptoms, diversity in tennis, and our favorite Ben Stiller movies. Let's find out more about this virus that halted sports in the first place with Pat McEnroe on this episode of The No Sports Report, with some sports now. Call from Patrick McEnroe. To accept, press 1. Press- Hello, Patrick. Yes, it is. This Jensen. Yes. Uh, well, I want to start off by just asking, uh, we've been going through this insane time in American history. Uh, where have you been quarantining, sort of holed up with, and who have you been with? Well, I've been with my family, luckily. We live just outside New York City up in Westchester, and we moved here a number of years ago. So we were already sort of in a self-quarantine, self-imposed in early to mid-March. And about a week or so into that, my kids had already started their online school. I said to my wife one night, you know, I'm I hadn't been feeling well for a couple of days and I uh, looked at her and I said, yeah, I think it's time maybe to take my temperature. So I took my temperature. Sure enough, I was over 100. It wasn't that bad. I was about 100.5, but I've been feeling weak and sort of tired and achy for a number of days. So then we put me in the basement. Luckily, we've got a basement, which I actually have access to go inside and outside the house. Oh, that's good. I was able to see my, yeah, I was able to see my family just sort of from a distance, but I stayed in the basement. I could walk outside and you know, take my dog for a walk, and my wife would deliver me meals inside in my area, the basement. So she would come down with gloves and a mask and, wow. and deliver me food. So that's how we survived for about a month doing that. Wow. I mean, I know you've been talking about it nonstop for months. You are actually my first guest who did positively test for COVID-19. We've had athletes who think they have, but we all know those people. First symptom you're saying was just a little bit of a fever. That was truly the first feeling you had? Actually, before that, I had a, a little more of a I would just say overall fatigue and, and body aches. And that was a little unusual. I was having a little trouble sleeping at night. So I just, just wasn't really feeling myself for a couple of days. And uh, it was really when I took my temperature that I realized, okay, I might, you know, may, maybe I actually have this. I had a little bit of a shortness of breath, which kind of came and went throughout the month or so. In fact, I still feel that a little bit now. When I take a deep breath, when I talk a lot, when I maybe run up a hill, something like that. So it feels like there's a little something maybe left over from it. But I never felt at the point where I was in any danger or I needed to go to the hospital. You know, I was in communication with my doctor fairly regularly. Yeah. Of course, at that time, everything was, was uh, hitting the fan here in this area, particularly in New York City and in Westchester. So my doctors and the people I was speaking to were dealing with generally much more serious cases than mine. Yeah, and so you have three teenage daughters. You uh, also, your wife is a Broadway actress. Her uh, obviously, her industry was pretty much decimated at that time too. I mean, w- were there any nerves about you passing it along? Did anyone else feel sick at the time? Well, no one felt sick. You know, my wife was pretty healthy. Obviously, we were we were nervous about it. Our kids as well. But you know, they'd had. You always go back and think. Well, did someone have a cough at some point? And one of my twins. My twins are eleven. My oldest is fourteen. She had a. Uh, a little bit of cough at one point. And, and funnily enough, we actually went in for the antibody test just last week. 
And one of my 11-year-olds was the only one to test positive for the antibody. Wow. I did not test positive for the antibody. So it's very strange. You know, the doctor can't make the heads or tails of it. So I think like everything else that's happened with the virus, it's basically the medical community seems to be playing a guessing game as they you know, get more information, see more cases. Mm -hmm. And that appears to be basically where we are still. Does that mean that the 11-year-old did have it? We don't know for sure. I mean, we think it's, it's certainly possible, but uh, you would think so. Actually, our neighbor, next door neighbor, is a family of five as well. They have older kids and a, also an, a 10-year-old 10, 10 girl. And she was the only one to test positive in their family. So who the heck knows? Uh, maybe I gave it to my daughter. Maybe she gave it to me. You know, most kids, luckily, knock on wood, don't um, you know, fight it off pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, I was lucky to also fight it off pretty easily as well. So sense of smell and taste, all that, that weird thing we hear from people, did you lose that? I did not lose that, but I had a, quite a few friends that actually live in my neighborhood that I lost that. I had a few other friends, uh, men in my age group, 45 to 55 in that range that I communicated with that had much worse symptoms at night, especially with the sweats and the very high fever really guys that really struggled with it. So I felt, again, that I was pretty lucky that I never had that. In fact, when I finally went for the test, I was a little surprised that I still had it because I felt pretty good. I'd been down in my basement at that point for about two weeks. It took me a while to actually get the test. Mm -hmm. You know, the state was just getting the testing system up and running. So I went to one of those drive through locations. Finally, it took about a week to just book the test. And they asked you all the questions, you know, have you been out of the country? How sick have you been? Have you been in contact with uh, people that have have had it. Of course, I, I, I had no idea. I'd been to Australia right. for the Australian Open at, at the end of January. So I was a little surprised when it came back positive. Uh, and then I went back for a test with my wife a couple of weeks later, and we both tested negative. Wow. It, I mean, it's so confusing. Like you said, there's so many conflicting reports about what we should be looking for. I mean, one of them that I think I'm, I'm most bewildered by is if we can catch it a second time or not. As someone who's already had it, what do you know about it? I don't know much about it yeah. other than it's possible. So I've, every time I go out or, uh, you know, I'm wearing my mask, uh, I, you know, what to me has changed at least in the last month or so is that doesn't appear where it's concerned about getting it by touching things. You know, initially we were, you know, I was wearing gloves to go to the store, to go to the pharmacy. I was sort of the one that was picked by the family to go out and, and pick things up when we needed them. So I would do that. I would wear the mask, the gloves, et cetera. That doesn't seem to be, what the current you know, medical uh, knowledge says, it's more about the transmission through the air. So you see a lot of people, at least here in this part of the country where I go, wearing masks when, they, when they're out going to the store, et cetera. You can't even go into a store if you don't have a mask. So uh, that, that to me seems to be the biggest issue at this point. But the short answer to your question is who the heck knows? Yeah, who knows? Uh, you, you're a busy guy all over the place, so many different jobs over your career. You quarantined yourself in a basement until you were negative, you said, about a month. There's a part of me that would love to be completely shut out, not have any responsibilities. <laughs> what did you do in the basement? What, when you got this time to yourself, what did you check off the list? Did you, did you finally watch The Wire? Did you, did you take up a hobby? Well, I finally uh, cleaned my office, which is downstairs here in the basement. So I, I, I did that. That took me a couple of days. And then, uh, you know, I watched some shows that I, you know, being, a, being married and having three young kids, you don't have, we don't have that much time to get into a particular show. So I watched a lot of old episodes of Homeland and I started um, Ozark. So I, li I enjoyed that. that. That lasted for a little while. But then I got into this podcast. I had a podcast portable machine in my basement that I had been preparing to start my own podcast, really going back to last year. And so it was uh, something that I had on my mind for a long time. Then I had the idea to interview people that were successful in their own right, in their own world, and had an interest in tennis. But tennis wasn't necessarily their profession. Right. So uh, I, I was stared at this machine. I said, you know, maybe now would be a good time to figure this thing out and learn this. And uh, so I did that. And then I you know, started looking at people that I've come across over the years that I know. And basically just did it myself, figured out how to use the machine, started calling people, and uh, started my own podcast. So that's been a lot of fun. That's kept me busy. In the last month, we've been able to get back in our tennis academy. I work at the John McEnroe Tennis Academy that my brother started here in New York City about 10 years ago. So I joined up with him there about four years ago. We haven't been able to yet open our facility in Randall's Island, which is part of New York City, but we've been able to open other clubs that uh, the company owns in the New York era. So I've actually been going out and, and working with the kids and 
even adults giving lessons at the club to try to help the club get back on its feet. And so that's been a lot of fun. So between the podcast and obviously managing the home front with my wife, who's been amazing through this, as you said, her career, at least performing live um, in front of people yeah. has disappeared, but she's been able to do a lot of performing from the house and doing a lot of shows. She's got a, a, another one coming up shortly. So she's really learned as well how to use a certain mic, use a certain lighting system. And I've had obviously do some of that as well with the podcast and also with just doing interviews here at home. More with Patrick after this. Now let's get back to Patrick. So on the tennis front, uh, the U.S. Open is set to be one of the largest American sporting events back up in action quickly, set to begin at the end of August. But there's still some mystery around if players will be comfortable. You're seeing that in the NBA and Major League Baseball. There's so many regulations and questions about safety. If you were still playing, where, what would you do? Well, it's a great, great question. I mean, first of all, let's put this on the table, that tennis is arguably the most global sport there is as far as players coming from all over the world and having to travel all over the world. Even the golf tour, which is very global, it's essentially the most of the American players play in America. Most of the European players play in Europe. They don't uh, hopscotch the world as much as tennis players do. So that's a complication for tennis because you got to deal with so many different countries and, and governments and, and where are they at in this process. Mm -hmm. uh, but tennis as a sport is a very easy game to manage. So I think as a professional, uh, the other thing you have to remember is that most tennis players essentially go paycheck to paycheck. I mean, they, they, they make their money by how well they do in tournaments. Of course, you hear about Nadal and Federer and Serena Williams, and, and they've made tons of money. They don't need, per se, the money that the tennis tour provides uh, to, to keep them going. Uh, but a lot of players, even players that are pretty highly ranked, I mean, they're not making any money at all. They're not like athletes in basketball. Uh, in hockey and baseball, baseball's having their own issues at the moment, but you know, yeah. that are in team sports where they're still getting a paycheck. So tennis players, I think have to weigh that against obviously traveling. Most of the players coming from Europe, coming to the U S being quarantined, essentially, or having to stay in one hotel by JFK airport and deal with all the, the parameters that are being put in place, which is a completely abnormal to what they're used to. They could usually have their own entourage. They can stay in New York City. They can go out. They can basically do whatever they want. But if they're going to come and play in the U.S. Open, at least as far as the way the rules are now, mm -hmm. they're going to have to abide by a lot of rules and regulations that they're not used to. Yeah, and that, that brings up another question that we, we see in every sport also, which is, you know, Serena Williams saying she will participate and Nadal, you know, won't. Uh, will this be a real U.S. Open? Because I'm nervous that all of these sports that are going to, you know, come back in 2020 are going to have these weird asterisks next to whoever wins these things. Oh, well, it's not the same. It was a different surrounding, different environment. All the players weren't there. Mm -hmm. Well, tennis has been through something like this before. Nothing like the pandemic, obviously, but there's a strike at Wimbledon you know, back in the seventies. And so that affected who won it. The Australian open for many years was sort of an afterthought until it moved to Melbourne park. It used to be a tournament over Christmas time. And most of the top players, a lot of them didn't even go. Yeah. So of course there will be an asterisk, I believe, just like there will be if the NBA plays, you know, if, the, if baseball plays 80 games and the NHL just goes right to the playoffs. So I think that will happen, but I think you have to weigh that against, okay, what's the alternative? The alternative, I mean, assuming it's safe, Okay, that's, that's number one. That's to be yeah. safe and healthy for the players, the participants, and the people involved with putting on the, on the game, whatever sport it is. So if you assume that's the case, then it's like, well, you know, as I've said many times, if my choice is to have a U.S. Open with no fans and all these other issues and potentially not every player playing for the reasons that you outlined or having um, no U.S. Open, I mean, I'll take the former every time. Sure. I'll take a U.S. Open with, with no fans and because I think that's in the best interest of the game. And certainly for the majority of the players, at least you give them the decision. Uh, it, it's in their hands. If you come, you can play and you can make a living. It's also obviously just important for our entire country and our society, right? To get back to some semblance of normalcy, whatever that may be. Restaurants in my town are opening. They're all outdoor seating. You know, things are starting to open up, at least here in the New York area. So I think that this would be a step for tennis to do the same. And uh, you are a prolific play-by-play -play announcer. What what is broadcasting of tennis look like at the U.S. Open? Do do we see a change in that as well? Are you guys going to be on other sides of the court? I think there's going to be a huge change. I mean, first of all, with no fans, it's going to be a whole different sound that you hear over over. In fact, I was on a Zoom call with all of our announcers at ESPN and our our coordinating producer just the other day when the USA announced their plan 
So it's going to affect our plans, you know, in a big way, not just obviously the production side, how many people are allowed on the site, who's allowed to, to get into the facility. Uh, well, what if we have a court side person that we normally do? The players will be able to hear them because there'll be no fan. Yeah. You know, there's no buzz, even, even the commentator. So the, the, the one part of it is it will likely be the only broadcasting uh, company there because of this. So all the Europeans and the international television companies will likely not be there. So that means that all those areas where they normally rent them out from the USA will be open. So I don't think we'll have any trouble meeting at ESPN distancing. If you could even have two commentators in a commentary booth, because they're usually pretty big. Mm -hmm. And if not, you could just put one here, one there and spread us out pretty easily. Yeah. I mean, it is comical to think that they might hear you guys. (laughs) I know because usually Arthur asked stadium, we're about midway up. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the stadium, but it's open, you know, because it gives you a feel, it gives you fresh air, you get a feel for the environment. But if there's no um, people there, the players will definitely be able to hear. Yeah. So, you know, particularly in a broadcasting voice, we're usually you know, up the volume a little bit. So, you know, Wimbledon, for example, we're right next to the court when we do the Wimbledon final from what's called the bunker there, right by courtside. So when the players play, we close the window because otherwise they could hear you um, very clearly so close to the court. So depending on what the tournament is, what the environment is, we're pretty much used to whatever it is. I used to call tons of matches when I first started ESPN from the studio in Connecticut. Sure. You know, call the Italian Open, call the French Open. So yeah. and Tennis Channel still does that. So that's certainly doable. It's always better to be there and, and to feel the energy, I was going to say, the players and the crowd but there will be no crowd. So the other question is, do you bring in sound? You know, do you come up with fake sound? Like they're doing that in Europe and in soccer, Mm -hmm. they're having one channel where you can listen to just the sound of what's going on in the field. And then they have another one that has sort of simulated crowd noise as well. So I think they let the viewer decide which one they'd like to do. It's like an SAP button on your TV. If you want to hear in Spanish. So they might try to do that in tennis as well. It's an opportunity for us in broadcasting, certainly to try some different things because obviously we're going to have to keep the attention of the viewer um, without having, you know, the crowd and all the different shots you can show. Because remember in a tennis match, you're just watching two players. Yeah. You know, golf tournaments different. You follow a golf tournament, you can pop around to each different hole. And you even on the final round, you can see loads of different players. Tennis, you've got to do a little more sometimes just to entertain the audience than just having two players, particularly if the match isn't that compelling. After this, more with tennis legend and host of the podcast, Holding Court, Patrick McEnroe. Right now, Feeding America is working tirelessly to ensure our most vulnerable populations, like students who are out of school, the elderly, individuals whose jobs are impacted, and low-income families continue to have access to food and other needed resources during the COVID-19 pandemic. The Feeding America Food Bank Network is committed to serving communities and people facing hunger in America, and their greatest need is donations and support of local food banks. This podcast is committed to donating a portion of the proceeds from the show to Feeding America, and we hope that you can join us in this effort too. Find out how you can help at feedingamerica.org backslash COVID-19. Now, here's the rest of my chat with ESPN tennis commentator, Patrick McEnroe. Let's talk about some other world changes. I have a one-year-old, so people I've been interviewing who have teenagers, I've asked them the same question, how you've been dealing with this time while raising, in your case, teenage daughters. Luckily, we've been pretty lucky that they're a little bit older, so they've been able to manage a lot of the school side, essentially themselves, with a little help from us, a little more help from my wife, probably in that department. But the school system, you know, has been pretty solid. My twin daughters who are big into dance are big uh, dance and, and ballet school. And they go to, they will actually commute to New York City. So that school started online Zoom dance classes pretty much right away. My older daughter is more of a competitive tennis player. So she can train with me, practice with me. As I said, tennis is an easy sport to, to distance yourself. So we were able to kind of keep up with a lot of the normal things that they do. Um, they were able to get out. We, we, we moved to the suburbs out of the city. So I think for the first time, my wife loved, he's a real city person, loves the city. So I think for the first time she looked at me and said, well, maybe we made the right decision leaving the city because now, you know, the girls can get out and about, ride their bikes and things like that. So we've been pretty lucky that they've been able to manage it, but obviously it's a lot more hands-on from the two of us as far as, you know, managing the household overall. Uh, You've been incredibly active to switch gears here a little bit over the years with youth and tennis, developing young players, representing the game, trying to push it uh, further and further. 
Uh, with what we're seeing around the world as far as the murder of uh, George Floyd uh, and so much that's going on as far as opening the eyes of others towards the plight of black people, what, what has tennis done correctly and what has tennis done wrong when it comes to diversity? Well, I think we need to hear from, from those African-American players a, a little bit more about what they went through. I mean, you hear a little bit about Venus and Serena because they're so popular and they're so worldly famous. Uh, but I, I immediately thought of a lot of the players I grew up playing with, you know, Malavia Washington, Brian Shelton, Lori McNeil, Katrina Adams, you know, hosts of African-Americans that, um, to be honest, as a kid growing up, you know, you never thought there were any issues. But now you, you, you kind of realize, wow, you, you, we're white people playing a predominantly white sport. And these players likely went through lots of things that we never knew about. So I think uh, it's, it's about James Blake, obviously a guy who played Davis Cup, who who had that horrible incident with the police in New York, in New York City, where he got attacked and had done nothing wrong. So he's been out there uh, talking about a lot of what, which I think is great. Uh, the one thing I think about tennis that is a little bit different in some sense is that, you know, my kids are, my twins are in ballet school. So we, they did an online thing for, for dancers and there was uh, some very successful African-American dancers. They talked about how difficult it's been for them in that world and that you know, because they didn't look a certain way, they wouldn't get certain parts. They wouldn't get chosen for this school. And my oldest daughter, we were watching it together. She said to me, well, ten I said, it's interesting, you know, thinking about this in tennis, because we see, we see lots of um, people of color in tennis, junior tennis, especially these days, which is great. Yeah. Really good. Okay. Partly because the success of Venus and Serena, but we, we sort of wonder, well, imagine what they had to go through. And my daughter said to me, she said, well, yeah, in tennis, so it's a little different because in tennis, you either win or you lose you know, from a performance standpoint. So it's a little different from being, say, an actor or, you know, even applying for a job in a company. You know, tennis, if you're good enough, whatever your background, um, nobody can stop you. And that doesn't mean you haven't had to deal with a lot of issues of racism, et cetera, and prejudice. Obviously, that, that I think, is the opportunity to, for tennis to hear those stories a little bit more from those people that have gone through the junior system, the college system, the professional system, um, and tell their stories. Because, I mean, it's time for us as as, uh, as white people and people that have had a, a lot of the opportunities they have and to listen. Yeah, I mean, you see 16-year-old Coco Gauff and, and Taylor Towns and obviously the Williams sisters. I mean, they continue to sort of shift the uh, the scene from sort of what we know is, I guess, has been sort of stereotyped as a, an old-fashioned kind of country club sport and become more of a, a face associated with the game, which you see sort of with Francis Tyfo, who recently said he thinks that maybe participating in the U.S. Open takes away from the social uh, message that we need out in the world right now, which we see with some of the players in the NBA. Do you, do you expect tennis players to, to be protesting, uh, taking a knee during the anthem or anything during the U.S. Open? I mean, I'd be all for it. I think they have every right to do what they want. I love what Francis has done. He's a great young kid. I actually knew him as a kid growing up in the juniors, watched him as a 15-year-old, so I saw him develop as a kid. He's a great, great boy. He's a young man now. He's not a kid anymore. But So I think for those guys to speak up is awesome. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that tennis players should do that. Uh, if that's what they want to do, absolutely. That's what this country is about. So uh, I believe they will, and we'll just have to see what happens. But it's certainly... Uh, they have every every right to be able to be heard, and uh, I hope they use it. I think they will. Uh, well, I like to end every podcast with something a little bit uh, positive, and then I'll ask you a dumb question. But first, uh, I want to know, you know, with all these things that we're facing, whether it's the quarantine, you faced it head on, or, or with the uh, racial conflicts that we're seeing in our world right now, what do you hope comes out of it? What do you hope even when we're out and about and eating in restaurants or, you know, uh, maybe some of the protests start to die down, what do you hope that we continue with? Uh, maybe a pattern or a behavior that you hope sticks around? Well, I think, as I said in my last comment, listening. I think listening, whether it's to your spouse, listening to your kids, listening to your neighbors, to what, what people of different backgrounds are saying, I think that's an opportunity also to slow down. Because I think the fact that we've had this pandemic and we've seen some of the, some of the police brutality and some of the abuse, uh, it's been because everybody's been in this position, it's kind of steamrolled where people are able to get out and protest and, and bring these things out into the open, into the forefront. So I think that's been a positive. And hopefully bringing all this stuff to the surface, we can realize that we really are in this together, you know, whether it's beating the pandemic or, you know, moving forward in the, in the race department or the sexism department, for that matter, which was the big issue before, you know, this whole thing started. So I think there's a lot of things that we can all do individually, you know, and, and I would say listen, number one, and then collectively as well. 
Uh, well, let's get into your new podcast. As you talked about earlier, it's called Holding Court, something you picked up during quarantine. You've already had guests like Alec Baldwin and Kyle McLaughlin on. A lot of people, like you said, who have fame outside of tennis but love the game. Who do you see as your dream guest? You know, I, I'm inspired by people that, that take up tennis later in their life when tennis is extremely difficult um, to, to get good at, even if you start as a kid. So I'm um, chasing down Elton John Ooh. because uh, he is a great tennis enthusiast and has played throughout much of his adult life. He's very tight with Billie Jean King. He wrote a song for Billie Jean. He used to do a big event every year that raised money for AIDS, his charity, and a big tennis event, which a lot of tennis people supported. So he's always been an amazing uh, person inspiring people. So he would be certainly at the top of my list because I'd like, I watched a movie about him and, you know, I've met him over the years just in some of the pro celebrity events and I respect him so much for what, you know, who he is, what he's done, his love of tennis and also trying to help people. Very good answer. So you had on Ben Stiller, we'll round out with this. You had on the great Ben Stiller on the podcast recently, a comic legend, in my opinion, one of my favorite directors as well. I was I listed out my top three Ben Stiller movies. I, I figured I'm springing this on you at the last minute. I'll go first, but you tell me if I'm missing anything or if your list is any different. Once again. Okay, you ready? So I have I have a, a movie that has had a little bit of <laughs> gotten a little bit of fire lately uh, because man, it was made during a different time. But I have my number three, Tropic Thunder. I think it's <laughs> okay. incredible. He directed it. All right. All right. Okay. So that's my three. My number two is uh, I think it's off the beaten path. I think it's something that more people should see. A movie called Flirting with Disaster. I did not see that one. Very good. Uh, Tia Leone's in it. You have uh, uh, an incredible list of actors and actresses in it that play the parents. Uh, I know Lily Tomlin, uh, really, really good, un, uh, sort of untapped. And then my number one, he's barely in it. He, he's he's not in it a ton, but he directed it. Uh, I Cable Guy is my favorite Ben Stiller movie. Yeah, Cable Guy definitely put in my top three. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Love that movie. Uh, obviously, Jim Carrey's amazing. I have to put Meet the Parents in there because I love, uh, you know, this sort of deadpan uh, and the way he worked with De Niro in that I thought was off the charts, phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I'm going to have to throw it just because for the outrageousness of it and for what what he was able to pull off in that one was Zoolander. Oh, good one. I love Zoolander. I thought that was hilarious. You said you you you, you dig a little deeper than I do in Ben is in all of his movies, but he's a great guy. I got to know him, you know, just. Fairly recently, he's always been a big tennis fan, mm -hmm. but uh, he started coming. He, he texted me uh, because he wanted to start playing. When he moved back to New York, and uh, I set him up with one of our great pros at our academy, and he was coming like three, four days a week wow. to play. And I'd see him out there, and he's working unbelievably hard. He's got a nice little lefty serve. He's, he's sort of spunky out there, pretty quick. So you know, somebody like that who so, gets so dedicated to trying something that. They've never played. As I said, you know, he did start in his 40s. Um, I admire that a lot about people that take up something that's really difficult to learn mm -hmm. and uh, commit themselves to it. I like it. Well, that's that's our picks. I also, Escape from Dan Amoro was incredible as well, which the the TV show he directed and EP'd. I don't know. Yeah. Did you see that one? You saw that one. Yes. All right. They're all good. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for talking to me, man. I'm so happy to hear you're healthy and I'm excited to, to see you back out there for the US Open and happy to hear your coaching again. I, I appreciate you talking to me today. Thank you for having me on. I really enjoyed it. The No Sports Report is produced and distributed by Treefort Media. The show is executive produced by Kelly Garner, Lisa Ammerman, Matthew Kugler, and me, Jensen Karp. Tom Monahan is our senior audio engineer and sound supervisor, with production and editing by Jasper Leake. Additional production help from Tim Schauer, June Rosen, and Haley Mandelberg. Our theme music is composed by Spilkes. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, please subscribe, rate us, and review us on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please visit feedingamerica.org. If you're able to make a donation, any amount makes a difference, and you can learn more about other ways you can help on their website. For more information on the No Sports Report, links to the socials, and for show transcripts for our hearing-impaired listeners, go to treefort.fm. Be safe and be well. The No Sports Report is a production of iHeartRadio and Treefort Media. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.